All right, welcome to the OVNI interviews where your hosts, Eric Bork and Mikey Taylor. What up? We're the co-founders of OVNI, a brand for entrepreneurs. Here on the OVNI interviews, we interview people doing the work they want and the lifestyle they love. Before we get started, let's really quickly uh, talk about our agency academy. If you are looking to start your own side hustle or uh, start a full-scale agency, um, go to ovnidigital.com where we have an academy that walks you through the whole process. This academy is everything that I did going from hit or miss video work to having multiple, let's say at times eight, five clients paying me a couple thousand dollars a month. And it's one of the best ways to get yourself going if you're looking to do your own thing. Again, that's ovnidigital.com. Today's guest, we are lucky to have with us. He is deeply rooted in skateboarding and um, he's a real estate broker. And we're gonna talk a little bit about some cool history in skateboarding today, as, as well as his journey to becoming, were you ever an architect, Greg? Or did you go straight into I real dropped, estate? Dropped out of school, but, okay. but started, yes, that was what was gonna be my next career. And it's a great story. So Greg, <laughs> thanks for being with us. Thank you very much for having me. Where should we start? Should we start, let, let's start a little bit what you do now. Give, sure. give us an overview, that was my intro, but give us an overview of, of what your life looks right now and what you do. And then we'll talk a little, about, a little bit about history and skateboarding. Sure. So I've been a real estate broker for 15 years now, based out of Beverly Hills. I'm with Compass, I'm the founding agent. I was with Cobalt Banker for 12 years prior. Um, Compass was a brand that was started in New York and expanded out west, and I'm one of the founding agents with, with it out west now throughout the U.S., 7,000 agents, and the company's grown dramatically. Um, so for the last 15 years, I've been a full-time real estate broker, residential transactions and commercial, um, some note sales, some hard money stuff as well, but in general, my day-to-day -day is 80% of my business is residential throughout L.A. And if you're watching this and you're a skateboarder, go to YouTube and look up Greg Harris Wheels of Fortune, right? Sure. Yeah. Greg, and let's also, you know a lot of skateboarders. Yeah, you know. been, it's been great to have uh, been able to work with most of the, the greatest in skateboarding and have sold their homes and helped them buy homes. So, Who are some skateboarders you've worked with? Uh, Andrew Reynolds many times, Jim Greco all the time, um, Eric Ellington, Mark Johnson, Guy, uh, I helped you guys get the park, I was the broker that helped put all that together, um, and a long list of many others, but yeah, most of the guys who have shoes, I have, <laughs> yeah. I have, uh, I have sold homes <laughs> Shoe for. companies and, where you get the money actually buy yeah, a house. Yeah, exactly, so uh, you know, that, that's that been great over the years to be able to do that um, and kind of live vicariously still a little bit through what they're doing and see yeah. how long many of them have, have still been doing it and doing so great. Yeah. And Greg was one of the first people I ever met, like in the industry. Oh, really? Yeah, because he was sponsored by Maple. We, yeah, we, you were gonna get on Maple, and we we came up. To, yeah, so uh, yeah, like no Ed, way. Jerry, Greg, a bunch of people came to skate Sequoia rails. So I'm like oh. 17, like just got started getting flowed from Maple, yeah. and Greg was there. I'm like, and I remember like you gave us a whole tour. We, yeah, we, yeah. 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 Yeah, so we touched base a long, long time ago. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That is so crazy. And, you know, I'm, I'm going to say something just for anybody that listened to the last episode and us talking about money. We love making money, right? We, lo we love figuring out how to make money and how to, you know, grow our businesses. But um, we did an episode called Money and Skateboarding, and it got viewed by, like, for us, it was a lot of views, a yeah. lot of listens. Um, you guys don't see the listens, but it got a, got, it got a lot of listens. So our focus in doing this, it, it wasn't necessarily to, to stomp on anyone's dreams in skateboarding. We love skateboarding. It's more focusing on the opportunity and, um, and what you can do and still, you know, skateboard until you don't skateboard anymore or do something with skateboarding. But we want to focus on the opportunities. And that's something uh, when I was pre-interviewing Greg that I talked about is let's focus on, you know, what if someone's a good fit to be a broker? Right. What if someone wants to do hard lending? There's lots of ways to make money. And Greg and Mikey have both done a lot of them. So I want to preface it with 
we're going to bring up a lot of opportunities and ways that people make money. And Greg's a great example. You've been in skateboarding originally from the Zoo York days. Yep. And um, let's kind of, do you have anything to say on that? No, I keep think going. I'm I just, interested. I just wanted yeah. to preface with that. Like, you know, we made a comment last time that most pro skateboarders don't make over $50,000 a year. It's nothing negative towards skateboarders. But how cool would it be if you were totally free to be a pro skateboarder and you made $250,000 a year on the side? Yeah. Like, that's a great opportunity. So, you know, there weren't many comments, but there were a few like, why are you guys hating? on? We're not hating on skateboarding. We're talking about the opportunities and our love for skateboarding. So let's go back. You grew up in London, right? Uh, East Coast originally, then London for six years. So I was BMX and then got into skateboarding. At, oh, really? At, yeah. So I was skate, started skateboarding in London at age eight or nine. Um, so great place to learn to skate street and all the parks, meanwhile, too, and everything under the bridge and all that. So did that and then came back to the States, uh, Washington, D.C. area. Uh, and then got into that whole scene, you know. Nate, what year was that? All that. Uh, I started skating in 86, 87, and then came back to the States in 90. Yeah, 91. Just so, when yeah. the scene started to yeah. evolve. And Small become, wheels, big pants, that, yep. that, that era. Uh, but yeah, we had Pulaski, just like, you know, Philly had Love Park. Mm -hmm. And, you know, so we had our own thing. And I, we used to just travel between New York, Philly, and D.C. There was like a heavy circuit going back and forth you kind of get to know everybody and there were multiple scenes within that scene too you know like philly had its own thing new york had its own things but uh but in general it was a great time and then kind of that early middle 90s was when i think the west coast started recognizing that it was a little bit different and then then it just kind of took off it was short-lived to be that but it but it did take off you know what though let's let's Paint a picture for anybody that didn't live through that era, those, because there's a couple of eras there, but yep. you know, back then you had no social media. No. Um, and I was, I was like just starting to, to skate. I lived in Santa Cruz at the time yep. and you had, um, you had Pulaski yep. and Love Park. I don't know how Love was back in those days, but then further along you had Love Park. Mm -hmm. You had Embarcadero. That was the era yep. when I grew up. Battle of the Bay. Yep in san francisco those were like it's almost like for youth culture they were like the the woodstocks or like the yeah. everybody yeah. would go there and you would go to san francisco and you would just go by embarcadero and just see yeah. who you could see and see who was there so you were in that scene before before zoo york right or was yeah. zoo york no, no, no. i didn't have any sponsors yeah okay before before i was actually trying to get sponsored by west coast companies just because New York was still trying to figure out what they were doing at the time. And, you know, I think I was trying to get on like Think or something like that, or maybe Adrenaline, I think maybe. Yeah. At, at, I forget, but around that time. But, but yeah, I think it was in the middle 90s was an interesting time where you had kind of East Coast and West Coast, and they were both trying to figure out their identity and, and do it. But, Tell um, us about Pulaski. And any, anybody who's watching from a computer, Google Pulaski Park and you'll see it. Yeah, Famous it's, it's skate still spot. there. Looks the same. Uh, the ledges are a little rougher, <laughs> but I mean, it's still the same thing, but it was a scene like at night, it, the dynamic definitely changed, but it's in a good area. You know, it's a mm -hmm. safe part of DC. So it wasn't like it was dangerous or anything. Uh, love was a little bit different in Philly. That was a little rougher, even though it was central city, but, um, it was just a scene. Everybody would go meet up there and that was before people were skating rails or anything else. So there was really everything you needed was there. There were stairs, yeah. there was a gap, there was... There was really no need to skate the rest of the city at that time um, until kind of big wheels started coming in and rails and then it yeah. started looking at other obstacles within the city to kind of skate. But uh, but it kind of had it all. It was marble. Yeah. Literally a marble plaza. I mean, you can't, I mean, so much better than Embarcadero as far as like being smooth and clean. Yeah. And oh, yeah. That. Um, so it, hard to duplicate that, you yeah. know. Uh, and who are some great. of the people that you used to skate with uh, in that era, like at Pulaski? That you would have heard, I mean, I grew up with Reese Forbes, so he was, you know, just always incredible ahead of his time. And, you know, there were times I didn't even know if he would choose skating because back then he didn't even always skate that much. Yeah. But he was just a natural athlete and clearly just leaps and bounds better than everybody else. Um, Scott Johnson was kind of, had already moved to California, but he was from D.C. and kind of, he made his mark more in San Francisco, but I think he was, he's from, oh. you know, where we're from. 
Um, Andy Stone, Evan Janke, uh, Carlos Kenner, all those guys were, were great. You know, they were really, you know, Element was a big part of that because Element sponsored a lot of guys. And I think for maybe people that didn't know DC, Element kind of put DC on the map, yeah. so to speak, because Johnny Schiller was willing to kind of like sponsor a lot of the guys, yeah. you know, so that was cool. Um, but yeah, no, it was, it was a great era and it's still going. I mean, a different batch of kids there now and Bobby Warrist is still, you know, yeah. you know, everybody passed the torch to him and he's done a great job too. But, uh, but yeah, it, it was a good scene back then. So what was skateboarding? Let, let's touch on you as a skateboarder. You skated, you were sponsored. Mm -hmm. yeah. Um, tell us about that. Yeah. So I got on a wheel company called Nicotine. Okay. It was done by I this guy, it. Mike Agnew, and then uh, he had gambling debts and the company went out of business. Oh. So, but there was First Division in Nicotine, and that was like a wheel brand that was out of uh, ECU, which is out of Maryland. And then I got on Zoo York only temporarily because we were going to do our own brand within Zoo York. But Zoo York had a lot of problems at the time, too, and there's a bunch of politics that I didn't really know about, but that were going on there. Um, and then we started Illuminati which was part of Zoo. And then just as that was getting going, there was problems with everything. And then Silver Star. <laughs> so I, I was a byproduct of like holding on for these brands to kind of finally get their legs. And they, they, Never they just always had different problems that were unrelated to, you know, we had great team, guys that were into it, Kevin Taylor, Jake Rupp, and it was a great group. It was just trying to find the right and they really wanted it to be backed on the East Coast, like yeah. to have no money backing from California and nothing. Um, and then eventually that all kind of imploded and I, I moved west. And, you know, like we were talking about on the phone, I, you kind of had to start a second career within skateboarding because you're known within an area. Yeah. And then you've kind of got to come to California and be recognized in front of California brands and yeah. kind of change your skating a little bit. Yeah, there was different such obstacle. A, it's like a different yeah. thing. There was such you know? a big separation back then between the two coasts. Huh? It was like starting over. It yeah. was the same sport, but you know, it, it, you know, different terrain, yeah. you know, um, just, just different, you know, yeah. and then you had to kind of come up through the ranks out here. And what was that like? Oh yeah. Hard. Yeah. yeah hard at, at first, but you know, I skated everything. So it wasn't like that difficult and I enjoyed it all, but it was, uh, as far as being recognized or having people have heard of you, it yeah, was so. harder to kind of start over. You know, a lot of my friends just stayed back East and went on to do other stuff and mm -hmm. never had like a second wave yeah. within the career. But, but, uh, but it was good, you know, it met a lot of great people too. The nice thing you come to California, it's like a whole new group of people and yeah, so it was good. So how long did you, when you came out to California, how long were you skating for? I first came to San Diego. I was there for like a year and a half. Um, it, you said 99? 98, 99. Okay. Yeah. And then I was like, I just, I had to get out of there. It was just a little too slow and I didn't know. Yeah. I just felt like I wanted to come to LA. I wanted to be in a place where I didn't know anybody. For the yeah. first time, for whatever reason, I thought I wanted to be somewhere that was bigger than me. San Diego was very small and uh, I was kind of starting to think I might get out of skating or at least the horizon of maybe what that would look like. And uh, so I came to L.A. and actually did the best skating in my career ever in L.A. Um, you know, uh, those last couple of years, the night 2000, 2001. And, and I think in 2003 I was done. How old were you at this point? 22. 22? 23, yeah. And yeah. I remember thinking when I moved to L.A., I was like, I'm going to be 23 next year. How much more time do I have left? Yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I mean, now there's guys and clients of mine that are 40 that, are 40 yeah. that just yeah. signed a shoe deal. Yeah. Yeah. And they look at me and go, I'm going to be in a van in the Midwest with guys that <laughs> I'm 43 because <laughs> I just signed a five-year contract. Yeah. So, yeah. You, you know, I think you know, it cuts both ways. But I think, uh, but yeah, so I was early 20s, which by no means old, but back then it kind of, Felt, felt like, gosh, how much longer can I do this for now? Yeah. Well, that was an interesting time in skateboarding, and we won't harp on it too much, but let's kind of talk about that for a second because at that time, I think, I remember, and I've talked about this a few times, when Muska bought a Pathfinder, and in mm -hmm. skateboarding, it was like, mm -hmm. he bought a car. Like, right. it was back then, and this, yeah. and then after that, um, you had the X Games came out. And yeah. I remember that was like Welcome to Hell. That was probably 96. Yep. And it was this weird thing because you had 
Jamie Thomas in the X Games and Tony Hawk making the X Games mass right. and the whole culture adapting to it. And all of us as skateboarders, we're going like, hey, this is going to be a big thing. Yeah. But yet all the, the I hate the word core, but all the core guys are like, Tony Hawk's lame. He's not cool. We're right. cool. You right. know, and then which now has totally transformed because, you know, he's one of the pillars of skateboarding. But it was a really weird time where it was like skateboarding is going to be it's and it was just all right. these things kept tabs like someone started a company and mm -hmm. then the company became big and then it, it started to get out there and it just was kind of becoming mass so it was like uphill but yeah there was this feeling of like how long can you do it and back then no one knew and again now you yeah. have guys that are in their 40s still making good money from plenty them. i'd say most of the guys that have shoes are between 28 and 38 mm -hmm. you know right i mean yeah and i think that didn't exist back then i mean most of the guys by the time back then like late 20s or even 32 or something would be done mm -hmm. yeah um and either be team managers or what they would still stay in but i think it just it cha it's changed a lot the longevity of people has gone for that group more than most i think like the yeah. group of guys that like the guys i looked up to as a right, kid right 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 are still in it today right but it's yeah. going to be interesting to see if the next generation below us ha that happens too. goes that yeah. long yeah because it know? didn't do that with my generation they didn't go as long as the generation before us right 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 so i don't know we'll see. and you have this yeah. crazy wave right now of like your post the other day people are doing the craziest it's like right. it stops holy shit yeah. skateboarding is getting so crazy they're doing yeah. it really good it looks yeah. good and yeah. like styles there and the yeah. tricks are getting crazy I, know. I can't believe we're at the point where you're like how much further can it go and it yeah. probably has a lot to go still like people are doing yeah. stuff that to me was literally unimaginable yeah yes that you wouldn't think could be done that way that good yeah well today my the observation that i have is kids can skate everything today yeah they can mm -hmm. and back then it was like you had to learn how to skate tra either you were like could skate transition or you would like make fun of the street guys that couldn't mm -hmm. kick turn you know on the quarter pipe you know so. but now these kids can skate bowls and then they can lip side a 20 stair rail and and do it all with style and it's kind yeah. of that's the biggest change i've seen is they the kids are like ATVs. They can do it Skate all. Skate everything and they all look good doing it. Yeah. yeah I know. And they, exist. they can get out because there was a time, let's call it 2003, 2004, where you had this surge of people doing the craziest tricks. But back then, the company still had the control and someone would go do a crazy trick totally. and even get in the magazine yeah. and they'd get nowhere. But now yeah, right. with social media, they can go look good, do it. And they get a lot of attention from it. Mm. And so it's kind of, and also companies are looking at, you know, the influence that that has on their sales. So it's an interesting time again, mm. you know, in skateboarding right now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So let's move into, um, we'll, we'll come back and touch on anything skate related, but let's move into your decision to pursue architectural school, Archi architecture. Yeah. Uh, I kind of always thought I'd be an architect or builder or some form of that so in the back of my mind I thought I'd skate as long as I would and then I'll just go do that mm -hmm. naive because I didn't know how hard it was like most things that's a gnarly thing to yeah, do right yeah yeah and uh, so went to school um, dropped out and said you know I'm gonna work for an architect for a little while before I continue through with this and decide whether this is gonna be the right fit work for an architect in Malibu for a little while um, and that was great but it, it was I quickly realized that this was not uh, gonna save me financially either yeah. you know it wasn't I was coming out of something where I never made a lot of money because I got out of it really before the shoe money really started coming in and then getting into this I think it was gonna be like a 10-year career where I had to work for somebody else to become AIA and then kind of do my own thing and I, to be honest I just didn't have the patience for it at the time and then I got into brokerage which takes a decade to kind of do so you never know but I just wanted to be closer to the transactions I wanted to learn more I didn't want to be just doing, you know, 3D renderings and stuff like that. I wanted to be, you know, uh, in front of people a little more. Mm -hmm. um, and I thought brokerage was the best way to to do that. And within that, there's so many different capacities, whether leasing, commercial, residential. I just thought in general that would be, uh, would open me up a little bit. Mm -hmm. So in 04, I started studying to get my license and had a job at night. I was delivering food at night, like high-end food it's still, <laughs> still delivering food at night yeah. and uh taking class during the day and then i got um a job managing an apartment building in hollywood hills that i 
that I lived in mm. uh, so that kept my overhead low. Um, and you know, I don't know how people do it today. You know, back then I was 26, 27, 26 or 27. You know, I, my now wife and I had just met, and she was like, "Well, the manager's leaving. Why don't, don't you want to be the apartment manager?" And I was like, "Why would I want to do that?" And she said, "Because your rent would be like nothing, or maybe maybe." I was like, "Okay, that makes sense. I'll yeah. do that." So did that, and uh, that was good. Did that for about a year, um, and that was great experience to be able to learn how to deal with people fix a boiler at night, deal with the owner. Yeah. So the owner, my first mentor in the real estate business was a guy who owned apartment buildings. So oh, that no was the seed that was planted that like this just makes sense. And I was always trying to figure it out like, why does he want to deal with all this? And why does he want to do that? And yeah. so I learned a lot from him. I learned a lot not, not to do what not to do, but also what to do. So just leased the apartment, showed them, dealt with people that were unhappy. So it was great experience for brokerage because yeah. that's, you know, same kind of thing. What was that transition like going out of skateboarding and into the um, business world, working world? It wasn't that hard because I just kind of disappeared. I just kind of started. I didn't, I wasn't that close with a lot of people that I was, it, that seemed easier to me just to kind of like separate. And, separate, uh -huh. you know. Um, Jai Bondarev and I lived next door to each other, like a block away. We were still really close at the time and um, you know, I still had some friends and, and all that, Lance Dawes and all those guys. But but in general, I, I kind of just pulled away from skating and just kind of got, not that I got new friends like mm -hmm. immediately or anything. Yeah. Or it, I thought it just would be helpful to kind of focus on something else and yeah. try to figure it out. But it wasn't easy. There was definitely, we're not talking about like a two year period here where I was, year and a half period where I was trying to really figure it out. Because once I stopped doing, working for this architect, I was like, okay, I thought I'd skateboard forever, then I thought for sure I'd become an architect, and now I'm not doing that. Yeah. So now what? So yeah. I was literally back to the point where most people probably are when they're in 18, skating, 18, 20, yeah. you know, so at the end of it at least. So I was confused at that point, lost, yeah. really. I was yeah. just kind of like, wow. I, so what do you think, because I think that's, the at least for me, it was always the hardest part to figure out what that next thing was that, mm -hmm. that would even, like, excite me or I thought would be fun. Right. But did it, it sounds like it kind of just naturally or organically happening. It did, it did happen. It seemed very quick. As I tell the story, it seemed like literally one day I was like, I'm going to do that. And I yeah. had no point of reference on it other than like maybe my friend's mom growing up sold houses. <laughs> so yeah. you, I didn't have a lot. Of, it's not like I had a friend who did it who's successful and said, yeah. come do this. I had nobody telling me, you know, I was going to be the, the, the Nike team manager. I was up for that job okay. right when Nike started the team. Oh, thing. yeah. And that was going to, that was what I thought was going to be my first thing. I was like, okay, I'll just be, I'm going to be the Nike team manager. This is going to be great. I was going to have to move up to Portland. I just met my wife and she was like, wow, okay. So I was like, but this big job, I'm going to have to do it. And it paid uh, like 60. I thought, we were talking about it. Yeah. I was on, I was shopping for houses. I thought I was uh, like picking out cars I was going to buy. I literally thought that 60 grand was going to be like, I it. made it. It's going to move to Portland. <laughs> yeah. Just like, <laughs> not retire, but like I you had my it. path yeah. set up. Yeah. Uh, and that's just interesting to think back on that time, like not having any uh, context of like kids and all the how other stuff, that, how expensive is. life is now. Um, but I thought that was a good, I did not get the job. Uh, a lot of people obviously wanted that job at the time because it was a big yeah. deal. It was a corporate company. It was solid and, uh, Forget who actually got it, but anyway. So when you were living in the apartment, what, how are you? You got you became the manager. How are you making money at that point? So my rent was like three or four hundred bucks, okay, you know, because I was managing the building. So then I was just delivering food at night. Okay, I that, for like a gotcha. high end uh, food delivery service where you would go to. Let's say husband and wife, the husband wants sushi, the wife wants steak. You go to two different restaurants and you bring it up to their house in Bel Air or whatever. Hmm. You take it out of the styrofoam, you put it on a plate, and then you leave. Gotcha. So we do that yeah. uh, from kind of like 5 to 10 at night. And uh, that was kind of a cool job. I didn't mind. I had the freedom to kind of just drive around, learn areas. It was actually very good for what I do now. And, and I did that for about a year. Um, so I supplemented myself, kept my rent low. And then just started going to an office every day and, you know, doing whatever I could to try to, you know, connect the dots and do a transaction. Mm -hmm. So it always interests me on how people originally got into things. So it sounds like 
you got your apartment manager position yep. and then you had someone that the owner yep uh kind of mentored you into where to get started in real estate a little bit yeah he he thought he's like oh yeah real estate's great you should definitely do it you know i think um he didn't have any experience on the residential side which is what i went into but i mean he clearly he was a hard money lender mm -hmm. who in the 90s took back some properties that he lent on didn't know what to do with them mm -hmm. he's like i don't really want this building but i had to foreclose on the note so then he got into it and then he went on to own like over 500 units before he passed away in 2011 but yeah. um but yeah so that was my first glimpse in, into that it was interesting how those seeds are planted early on like you know, he was put into my life for a reason to learn yeah. about like something. It would, it would take now. a while for me to come full circle and and actualize it. But you know, it's kind of interesting how you meet different people for that for that yeah. reason. But, um, but it so was then, cool. when did you step into selling homes full time? Oh four. Oh four. Yeah. Oh three. I got license. Oh three or four. I got license in two thousand four. I was full time. I I think by the end of oh four, I'd quit the food delivery. I'd done maybe three or five deals my first year. So I'd made a little money enough to kind of quit. Um, got myself a decent car that didn't have like a peeling hood and yeah. <laughs> you know, uh, all of that. And um, yeah, so I think probably about a year and a half in, I bought myself like a little B used BMW and, yeah. and, and kind of from there. And also we had a good market back then because it was 05, yeah. 06, 07. Yeah. So I was able to kind of get some traction going. Um, you know, and my first client was actually a guy from skateboarding, uh, Doug Prudy, and a good friend of mine who still works in skateboarding, and um, sold him a condo in West Hollywood. So I, it started with skateboarding. And yeah. I was like, I think this is, I had done, I knew nothing, but I was like, I think this is a good area you should yeah. buy here. It's yeah. Like, okay. So you started yeah. as, a, as a residential agent. Correct. Yeah. Which is what I still am today, but I do do commercial deals and okay. do things like that. Yeah. And then, um, from there, how did you get, let, now let's start talking about kind of your, the opportunities and how the opportunities that you saw along the way and how your career kind of went in different, I mean, you are an agent, but you yeah. do a lot more than that. Yeah. I mean, I always liked the investment side of the business. And at one time I did consider going into commercial and just focusing on that. I'm kind of glad I didn't because now I'm able to do much more. I have a much more well-rounded background on it, but I did consider that at one time, but I like the investment side of it. It's a break from the emotional aspect of all other real estate because residential mm -hmm. real estate has a strong emotional mm -hmm. component. Mm -hmm. uh, you're dealing with money and people and emotion. It's, it's very different than the business side of it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's nice to kind of have both sides. And I had these two attorney brothers that gave me a chance in 2009 eight and nine and i did a bunch of multifamily deals with them and just kind of really learned the business and um built them a big portfolio they passed away as well so i've had my first couple mentors and people that really helped me unfortunately passed away you know six seven eight years ago but um but anyway so it was a good experience to have those somebody's got to give you a chance in the beginning he literally came in and said i want to buy units i was like i can help you with that yeah. i didn't know anything but I helped him with it and he, he did great and uh, he was loyal and I was loyal to him. So it was a good, it was a good working relationship. So the, let's, let's run through what are the different components of what you do today? Break down like the different aspects of what you do today. So I focus most of my energies on listing properties. I do still represent buyers, but the majority of my business, I'd say 60 or 70% of it is creating a strategy for somebody to sell a property, pricing, marketing, whatever that is. Uh, I run a team of three and administrative and buyer's agent. So kind of a extension of me and that's my focus. But then we do still represent buyers, you know, throughout LA, we've done a lot of deals down here, downtown, but we don't do much in Malibu or in the South Bay, but basically Santa Monica to downtown, we, we do throughout. So um, brokerage business, solving problems, <laughs> you know, dealing with strategy. Um, so that's basically my, my day to day. Um, and most of my time should be spent on new business. Unfortunately, it's not always you're dealing with what you have going now, but, but that's generally the idea. It's no different than any other sales business, but, um, but over the years, I've tried to just focus more on the listing side of it, less on the buyer representation, because obviously on the buy side, you have no contract. It's, you know, yeah. uh, the, the, the challenge on the listing side is you're fronting a lot of money for marketing expenses of things that don't always sell, mm -hmm. you know, so you have to make business mm -hmm. decisions on whether, you know, 
you could spend five or ten grand to market somebody's property at a price that they chose that's not yeah. commensurate with market. So you've got to kind of figure that out and make a business decision. Okay, this makes sense, or I feel like I can really help them, or whatever it is. But um, but yeah, just brokerage. That's basically okay. the the core of my business. And yeah. And then uh, what about the hard money lending? Just got into that, so you know, been saving for a while. Explain to people. Just uh, we might have. Pe- some listeners that don't know what that is. Can sure. you explain what hard money lending is? Sure. So hard money or private lending is a uh, an individual or a group that will lend money. It's asset-backed lending. So they lend on an asset. It's not a business. And um, the terms are usually shorter, one to three year loans and three being long, but most of them about a year. The interest rate is higher. Um, the buyer still puts a down payment down, but instead of underwriting or deciding whether to lend on somebody based on credit score or things like that, you're lending strictly on the asset. That there is one, uh, it's usually builders, developers, investors. Um, hard money loans don't happen with helping somebody buy a home who's got bad credit. Yeah. But, um, but it's an option for an investor to get um, quick money. Usually the hard money loans, you can turn them around in a week to two weeks versus 30 to 60 days. Um, it is more expensive, but you know, it's fluid, you know, so, um, so the investors like it because they don't have to deal with bank regulations. They don't have to give up a bunch of information to a lender. Um, don't have to give up tax returns or any of that stuff. Um, and they like the speed because sometimes they can actually make money on the speed of moving as opposed to having it take longer yeah. and having it be a couple points cheaper. So give us an example of, I'm, I'm picturing all these scenarios in my head, but for the listeners, give us an example of this person borrows this much money over this period of time. What does that deal look like in hard sure. money lending? I'll give you an example of the, the deal we have now. So an investor buys a house for a million five. He puts half a million down. He needs a million dollar loan. We give him the million dollar loan we syndicate it, so myself and a couple other partners give him the million, and then he has a year to pay that back, and he pays nine or ten percent interest on that for the year. Um, in that year, he gets plans, permits, and everything ready to knock the house down to build. We get taken out at the end of that year, and he gets a new construction loan, which we could decide to give him or or not. And then he's got a construction loan for probably about 18 months to build a new house. So that's an example where you're giving it to somebody. So it's asset backed lending. Mm -hmm. We're lending a million dollars on something that's worth a million five. The house is still there, still standing. We didn't lend on dirt. Um, If we had to take it back, there'd still be a house there. Um, So it's pretty well hedged. Plus he's got half a million in that example, uh, you know, in the deal too, that it, that hopefully he doesn't want to walk away from too. Mm-hmm. So awesome. there's certainly risk involved, but it's it's uh, measured risk, I think. Perfect. And then, what do you see as being the the opportunities for people getting into the real estate space? I just still think brokerage is the best you don't? option. I do. I oh, do. you do? I do. Yeah. yeah. Okay. 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 I, I do. Because <laughs> I Mike get, is like, what? <laughs> no, people. I think I get hit up more than anything on how do I get involved in real estate what's right. the best way to start and i think a lot of even skaters we're starting to see a lot of pros totally totally move into selling yeah. homes yeah right yeah. totally um totally yeah yeah i'd love to hear your thought on I, I think brokerage is still the best way to do it and the great thing about it is you could get into it and figure out which capacity you like or works for you like we we're talking about on the phone you know leasing there's you could be in new york city you can make a great living just doing leasing like mm-hmm. it's crazy the fees that they have there to do that um so you could be a rental agent, you could be a commercial agent, you could be a residential agent. So I think within it, there's all different capacities that somebody could do. Um, I think the best thing to do is to work with somebody who uh, who's already up and running. Mm-hmm. They didn't really have teams, real estate teams, when I started. Otherwise, maybe I would have looked at doing it. But now teams are big. It's very difficult to do, you know, for me to be everywhere at one time. Um, and it's it's not effective for me to be great at the paperwork and create, you know, I don't. There's certain things that it's better, somebody else is better at, and mm-hmm. I can focus on other things. Yeah. These are things you learn. I did everything myself for a decade so before finally getting help. So yeah. I'm just giving everybody my own advice. But I think, um, I think brokerage is still the best way to get started and working with a team where you have the opportunity to hold open houses, hear the language, 
um, kind of shadow somebody, it will uh, speed up your learning curve like tenfold than if you try to do it on your own. Totally. Because you end up, you know, this business, you're kind of on an island. You're by yourself. A lot of sales businesses, you're, you have to self-motivate. You have to get out there. And when you're not out there, you're by yourself, mm -hmm. you know, and that's kind of hard. Uh, anybody who's ever done any kind of sales can understand that it's kind of hard to, yeah. to deal with that. So if you can have somebody, you know, who you can shadow and work with, I think it's the best. Uh, plus, it gives you instant credibility if you say, I work with a group or I'm, yeah. I, agree. I work, you know, I think that's just a much better way to go. I think it's short-sighted to think of, well, I'll be giving up a part of my commissions. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe, but... If you can learn in two years what would take you five to seven on your own, then I think that's worth paying for. So look for a team. Are there any sites or any uh, anyone to follow? I mean, obviously follow at, it's at Greg Harris, right? <laughs> sure. uh, he, he shows you have a good social presence. Um, but are there any better. resources? That, yeah, mine too. Um, <laughs> is, is there any resources that you could throw out there for people that are looking at like this might be for me? And if not, think of it and we'll plug it at the end. Yeah, I think really just sitting down with a broker that you're considering joining or a team and having them really be honest with you about, about that mm -hmm. and talking about the strategy and then looking at what your client base looks like. Like, how are you going to get business? Um, did you come from skateboarding? Do you have access? You know, whatever it is, I think you've got to figure yeah. out what it's going to be. You can work with strangers, but only so many in the beginning. Yeah. You have to start with some kind of base of sphere of influence and whatever that ends up being. And everybody has a different one. Yeah. Um, so I think you've got to kind of figure that out. But I think it's hard to go online and kind of look around and make that decision because I think it's a little misleading. Uh, I think it's yeah. better to kind of sit down with somebody, uh, whether me or somebody else, and have them just be honest with you about the pros and cons of it, the challenges you might face, and what, what might be the best fit for you. What do you think the best way of finding, let's say there's a kid in oh, Wisconsin. Yeah. And he, okay, okay, Greg, I'm listening, I hear you. Yeah. Mm, who do I go, how do I find that person? How do I find the Greg out there? What do you recommend for a kid to do who wants to get into this world and is going, yeah, but I'm all well, the way I, here. I think every market's different. So mm -hmm. I think geographically it's, it's difficult maybe for me to answer questions about somebody wanting to get into the business in Wisconsin. Mm -hmm. But uh, if somebody was moving here or trying to figure out what that would look like if they did move here, I think you just have to have those one-on-one -on -one conversations. It's not... It's not cookie cutter where you can say this is gonna this is the formula. Yeah. You know, uh, the discipline aspect of the business is like the military, but everything else is kind of a little bit different. Um, I mean, the discipline has to go. There's no way around that. Yeah. Uh, but we were talking. I think that the great thing about it is when you come from a skateboarding background and you're used to doing the same thing over and over and mm -hmm. over again, it makes the business a little easier because you're used to that, that yeah. ingrained way of practice, whether it's practicing or just getting better. I think we spent, you know, 20 something years getting better at something. Now you just move it to hopefully another more than 20 years getting better at something else. Yeah. But I think that's kind of the, the idea. Well, I think that was a great, I think that was a great point is find a team that you can join, be a part of and learn the business quickly. Yeah. And then you can kind of branch out from there based on your skill set and how well you do. Right. It and might maybe not be a fit. Ad, maybe an admin position, maybe a buyer's agent, because within team, maybe a marketing person, maybe you're like a really great at social media and you want to get into real estate. Well, you could be a great asset to a team who, like myself, it is not my that. strong mm -hmm. suit. You could really just be the person that's helping direct the vision, the branding, mm -hmm. and you know. So there's, uh, I think that's actually a great way if you if you're really proficient in, in social media. So can you talk about? And we might you might say no. Can we talk about like some stuff within skateboarding that you've done? Like, can you talk about that publicly? Like some of the deals, and we were just talking about it um, off mic. Is there anything you can talk about? Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, listen, I've sold homes for a lot of the skate guys, which has been great. But I think um, as far as stuff, I mean, there's nothing really that it's too secret or anything. Yeah. I think the I think the investment stuff is probably uh, better kept a little more of private. Course. So let me, let me the off market that. stuff. Yeah, for sure. What do you so for a pro skateboarder? This is yeah. a big part of my world. Yeah. What do you think is a good way for them to 
what are good options for them to invest in you? What are good ways that a pro skater should be, think, be thinking, okay, how do I get my money to work? What are these mm-hmm. different things? I hear this guy talking about real estate. What, what would you recommend them doing? Because I know you work yeah, on that so side. Yeah, so like six or seven years ago, one of the guys came to me and he said, you know, how do we replace my shoe deal? Like that was his ah, that's such a good, that's so good. So yeah. it, it's, and, and he told me how much he's making. I said, okay. From he a wanted ca- to replace it annually from a cash flow standpoint? Yeah. All right. He's like, because it's going to well, go away. Well, you didn't away. say a name, so you're trying to replace what per year? Uh, a six-figure shoe deal. Okay, six-figure shoe deal. Yeah, and you're trying to, to duplicate that year after year, um, and that's a big ask because in real estate, that doesn't happen immediately. You have to grow into that, but the difference is somebody's coming from something where that, not instantly, but it just started happening. It just yeah. doesn't last for as long. So we created a plan to grow the business and start buying some things, letting the market come, sell them, and now finally getting into things that actually return. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're not there, but close. I'd say within, you know, over half of the, over half of the shoe check is now in something else. And last year, one person made more, does very well, but made more in real estate with me than they made skating. So that's, I don't think that's happened a lot, but I think it'd be interesting to see that happening to more people who yeah. are able to kind of duplicate the, um, the shoe deal because that is, the shoe deal when you're in it, I think is the one that where you feel like you can retire off that and everything. It's the only one you can really make It's the only one money. you can, yeah. you know, but um, even now as you get older and you start learning, like those shoe deals aren't for many even enough to yeah. retire. So sure. there's something yeah. gotta be done with that. But then, but then you're worried you're never going to see it again. So sometimes you're scared to, to invest it. So there's that too. It takes a lot of courage to do it. But I think, I think that that has been the plan and that has worked and it's been great to kind of help guys kind of do that and be able to, to, to do that. Because I think in the next couple of years, there's a lot of guys that are making a lot of money now who will not be maybe Uh making a lot of money. I think we're going to see a big change Change, and it'll go to different guys, but I think, there's a lot of guys, you know, there's going to be fewer maybe moving uh-huh. forward. I don't know. But, yeah. um, but I think, again, multifamily in the long term is still, I believe, to be the better. Yeah, what, are all, of, the, what are all the asset classes you like to invest in? So um, I think retail is a little tricky because you've got to be able to, it, when that's vacant, and that can be vacant for a year or two. Uh-huh. Uh, and I think that's really hard for a newer investor to stomach. Uh-huh. Um, the benefit of multifamily, if you have an eight unit building and one is vacant, you probably can still service the loan. Uh, it's probably the safest. Uh-huh. Uh, the government still insures loans on it. Um, I think industrial's kind of interesting. Industrial's hot right now. Hot, yeah. hot, hot, hot. But it was, uh, but it's expensive. Yeah. And it's the same kind of thing. We've looked at a lot of them. Um, you know, wish the guys would have bought the skate park uh, back when. I know. When we, I think we could have bought that for like a million two, yeah. a million million two. Um, but I think the industrial is a little tricky just because you have to kind of service the debt while it sits vacant. So I just still think apartments or getting started small, duplexes, fourplexes, something like that. Maybe you live in one. Do you guys do a lot of flips, residential flips? Uh, we have, yeah. Yeah. Go for ahead. anyone who doesn't know, why is it so hard to buy right now or to find a deal to flip? I think in upward trending markets. Fixer properties are priced very close to properties in good condition. As markets change, that gap becomes wider. So in the last couple of years, you have been paying a premium to to buy something that needs a lot of work. As the market's trending up, that works okay, because while you're working on it, you're essentially making money. As markets become flat, you end up, uh, that becomes a little more challenging, Mm -hmm. because you end up, uh, you end up basically maybe having a plan that doesn't work out at the end and then if it doesn't make sense to rent it then you have to sell it and like we've talked about it's the best thing about real estate is really looking at something and having two exit plans that Mm. both make sense yeah because then you can make much more sense of it going in if this doesn't work i can do that Mm -hmm. um and that's always i think the best thing gosh forgive me i wasn't paying attention to real estate in the in the recession but what happens to the shows like all the house flipping shows are they do they still go they go away i don't even know if they were yeah i think they they were on they they were just in like different areas you know Mm. they were in like Focusing on like Vegas and stuff like that, where it was just mm. you know a lot There's, of foreclosures. They've been so hot for the past like four or five years. Are um, they still really hot? Oh yeah, real estate shows are huge. Just are. in general, every capacity. Yeah, is right just, now yeah. it's just 
HGTV is just on fire. And they're, they're very interesting also. Yeah, yeah. Like, no, there's some good ones. So let's not use this as like, we're telling you this is how the market's gonna be, but no. just out of curiosity, where, where do you see the market going? I think we're flat for a little while. I think we're, you know. We've hit it. Everybody thinks we're going down. We, we can't go down until, we have to go flat before we can go down. So I think what's happening now is just a cooling off of where things are. I think it depends uh, where you are, uh, what, what you have, what product type, but I do think um, fixer properties are definitely gonna be trading for a little less than maybe they would have last year. Um, but every neighborhood's different. I think, you know, LA is a, is a town of villages and every yeah. neighborhood has its own nuances. Yeah. And uh, uh, I still think there's a lot of upside uh, in certain areas, but I think, um, but I think in general we have, we are flat. Yeah. And we probably have been for eight months. Yeah. Six to eight months, I think. So what would, uh, can we talk about any specifics? Like what the, just so you know, I don't know if the listeners caught it, but Greg handled the deal on Beebles Park, the yes. park that went off in 2016, where we skated every single day. Um, you mentioned that if they would have bought that back then. Yeah, because they... What do you think that building's worth right now? Uh, what is it, seven, 7,000 square feet? Um, is it only seven? Yeah. I thought it was more than that. Mm -mm. 72, 7,400 feet. Um, yeah, I think, well, first of all, they came to me and they wanted to do a park and I was like five guys, this sounds like this and the commercial leases are long, right? So mm -hmm. they're, you're committing to your buddies for like five, seven years. Yeah. And, and I don't think anybody knew how long it was going to work out or not. And, uh, it's done incredible, but I think, um, yeah. So we looked around, we looked down here, we looked downtown, outskirts of downtown, we looked in the valley and, and that one just seemed to make the most sense. I think selfishly, some of the guys lived out there and it was just closer to home, yeah. but it was perfect, you know, and, uh, we put that deal together and then the renewal came up and we did the renew, handle the renewal and everything. And, um, yeah, that's just been an incredible opportunity and grown so many people's businesses from that too. What would it, can you say, what would, what was it valued then? What's it valued now? Would that have been a good, uh, purchase back then? A double. It would have been a double. That's a double. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Wow. Okay. That's a double. So there, there's a great example. That's a great example. And oh. at the time, the guys that were doing it could have done it, mm. could have structured it. But again, kind of like not everybody in the same, you know, yeah. on the same page yeah. at the time. But I think it was possible if everybody agreed, you know. Uh, but no, it was... Uh, it was, it's def, it's, that's definitely doubled. So let's also talk about anybody that's listening and, and we get the, well, I should say Mikey gets it a lot um, because he's doing a capital company of if someone has like five or $20,000, what, what do you do with that? How do you grow that? Five is I think different than 20, 25. I mean, well, let's say, let's say yeah, five no, I think, to I think 15, that's right. five to 10. They own I, their think own business. I think five is a conversation where you probably invest in yourself to get better or to help you get in the direction of wherever it is you want to go, get that job or get that license or whatever you feel that you need to do, because that'll go pretty quick to get started anywhere. And then you start talking 25 to 50, um, you can either invest with a syndicator, depending on the rules and regulations that they have, or um, you, could, you could invest again in yourself and do something more entrepreneurial and try to do your own thing to grow that. Um, but I think, I think five is tough. Five or 10, I would, my suggestion would be to put that back into yourself and invest in self-improvement. How in do some you way. feel about uh, like a safety net? How do you feel about people having a certain amount of money for the unexpected before they invest? Just out of curiosity. Yeah, I think uh, me personally, I, I like the, I like it and have to have it. And I think everybody, everybody's threshold is different. Um, the one thing I will say is I don't believe anybody gets huge leaps forward without going all in when they do. Yeah. Now that could be when they have enough to save and keep, but I don't think, um, I, I think it's hard to take a hundred grand say and put five grand in 20 different things. I'm totally with you there. I, I think maybe one of them hits, but if you're looking to really grow something, I think you should stay focused and whenever the time is ready, you go all in on that. I think the, the upward mobility on that is greater. Uh, yeah. It's just my opinion, but I think everybody's, it's, it's the opposite opinion of like a, somebody that would manage stocks. 
Yeah, you know, totally they would say, diversify. you know, spray and pray that it all does well. But I think, uh, I don't know, if you're an entrepreneur, I think you just keep your reserves, but then when the time is right, you kind yeah. of go all in with whatever that is. Yeah, yeah. I, I generally agree. I think I'm maybe more, I would say a hybrid of the two, because yeah. I, I do believe that like, if if you have something, you, you go with it. But mm-hmm. but for me personally, this just could be a, just a personality thing. Yep. I don't know if I would ever go all 100% in on one thing. No. That might be because of the where I'm at in my life, I don't know, but, yeah. but I definitely do go 70, 20, 10. Yeah, you know. yeah, and that's good too. And I think that, that you, you make real impact. You have enough to make a difference. Mm-hmm. And I know that's probably not what everybody wants to hear, maybe that has five grand, but I just still think um, the self-improvement aspect is really important. I agree. I think that's great advice. I, I mean, for, I'm gonna talk myself for one second here, but for me, I never had, like I had this corporate path, right? And I could have had the same job, worked in the skate industry. And now that's kind of scary. Now, like if you look at the skate industry now and having a job, like back in the day, like when the era we were talking about earlier, yeah. you just go get a job. You get, you're a team manager or a mm-hmm. filmer or mm-hmm. you go do sales for the skate company because you're in the skate industry. Um, for me, I needed like, the ability to say I can go out and kill it at something and bring home a lot of money. And for me, that was starting my own agency and figure now I have want to eat what you kill basically. Yeah. And I, I didn't before after being a pro, you're like, Oh, it just comes to you. And it was a huge wake up call from going from that to like, I have to go out and figure out how to, you know, kill like get my money, bring it home. Mm -hmm. And and the self-improvement aspect, if you have a little bit is, figure out a way to do something where you can master it and then go out like right now i hit the streets well i should say however many years ago 10 years ago i hit the streets so hard that now i have the ability to go out and cold call and make my money which is a great feeling right um so developing that whether you put it into you know a program where you become you gain this skill where you can make your money i think that's a great point um what are you saying mikey and i think yeah I think at the end of the day, your biggest return is investing in yourself. Yes, right, totally. Because you have the ability to produce more income to actually go invest in the things. And I want to push it further to anyone that thinks that sounds cliche. I will tell you, I spent three years trying to figure out how to start an agency on my own. And then someone showed me how to do it. And it took like a month before I was like, I get it. I can go out, I can do it. And it just would have happened so much faster if I would have invested into someone teaching me how to do that. Yeah. Um, so I think that is, I think that's definitely true. And we were talking like, that's what Grant Cardone says. Like I have five grand. What do I do with it? invest in yourself, figure yeah. out how to make more money and get really good at it. And until you learn that the chokehold of what you're doing is probably you. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> or not doing is probably you. So once you figure that out, then you can go back inward and kind of, uh, you know, say, okay, well, let, then there's lots of self-improvement I can do to help get me past whatever blocks I have. Where can I get know, better? Like what I do I need so to learn? Important. Yeah, yeah. I think that's so important. Yeah. I, I, part of me feels like skaters, I, I struggle with this for a long time. I feel like skaters have this block that like they mm-hmm. don't believe or, or really think they could go out and do like anything they want. Like, right. I, th- well, I hold on, victim though. to that. I think it's more than skaters, though. I think it's People. athletes in general. I think as an athlete, and I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying, I'm adding to it. I think that as an athlete, your financial reward and your social reward comes from, I performed like this. Now everybody's like telling me, good job, giving me money. Like back in the day, it was like, I did this on my skateboard. I, I filmed a VHS part that's three minutes long. Everybody watched it. I get paid. That's uh, what you did. Yeah. And that really is a challenge I think for a lot of athletes. Like what do you do outside? What happens is you have confidence in that and then you go to do something else. I I had no confidence in anything else. Yeah. Because I hadn't done anything else well. Yeah. (laughs) Right? So that's the problem and and you're either 25, 35, 40 years old trying to transition out of skateboarding into something else and you only have confidence in one thing that's been grooved in your entire life and that's really hard. That's Mm. You know, I didn't realize I had a I had low self confidence until skateboarding was over, and then I was like, "Wow, I'm actually not really that confident in all these things." Yeah. And then it just takes a long time to build that up, and nobody can do it for you. Mm-hmm. People can't even tell you you're great. It's still something you've got to do to kind of yeah. 
go through it. But that's hard um, when you've only been confident in one thing. Mm -hmm. I'm on this tear right now. I told Mikey about it yesterday of like, if I'm not the person, then I need to be the person. Like I need to figure out how to be like, what skills do I need? What am I lacking? Like I need to figure out how I can be better so that I'm not better than everybody like they suck, but I need to be just as good as them so yeah. that I can do it. It's like, and this is a silly analogy, but it's very true. The guys that don't have league awareness when they're dating and they're like trying to date all these like successful, gorgeous women and they're not doing anything and they're out of shape sitting at home. What do you it's call like, it? League awareness? League awareness. I've never heard that. I've never heard <laughs> that. You've never heard of league awareness? No, I've never heard of league awareness. <laughs> oh, like gosh, they're not had, aware that this chick this, is out of their league? Oh yeah. We had this <laughs> one friend and he would always go for these girls and we would be like, <laughs> Doc, bro, bro we do it but yeah. it would never pull through but it's just like at some point you have to look at yourself and be like okay what do i need to do i need to learn this skill i need to learn this skill and i think we go through times of i went through a time where i was like how do i build a website how do i charge money for it how do and i was just learning and learning and learning and for some whatever reason that can kind of stop yeah and i think it's recognizing i've stopped learning i've stopped progressing it it comes back to making myself better so that I'm attracting these things. And then once you start focusing inward, and I'm not preaching, I'm saying this is kind of like something I go through. I go through cycles where I'm like, that's why I'm not doing it because I'm not the person. So right. I need to be the person. Right. Um, sorry, I just kind of went off there. Great. But, I'm no, still, no, no. Makes sense. Fired up. Yeah. I, yeah. Like Mikey gets fired up on numbers. And it's funny. <laughs> we, we had, a, we had a, a podcast last week and we started talking about syndication uh -huh. and like, you see me go through like normal podcast mode and then I just all of a sudden just like yeah. fired up, right? Yeah. And what's funny is I, I got so many DMs today because the podcast came out today. Yeah. I got so many DMs. Yo, bro, I could tell you're like lit about this. Like, <laughs> let yeah. me find out about it. It was like so yeah. funny. But, and uh, at the beginning he was like, I don't, I'm not going to get I'm through so it. Tired. I'm, tired. I'm so tired of the podcast. I'm like, and then we started talking about syndication. Yeah. I started getting so excited yeah. about it. Yeah. I love it. I, I really think it's cool. But, yeah. No, anyway, so, so guys, if you if you love what if you love skateboarding, if well, whatever you're doing, if you love it, just look at the other opportunities. That that block, for some reason, it keeps coming up. What you described a minute ago, that block of like I have to just focus. I think that is a kind of. Um, go I'm, ahead. I'm sorry, I'm gonna cut you off. No, I, go ahead. I I, I kind of think it could be two different things. For me, a lot of it was, and I recognize it from Paul because Paul mm -hmm. never had this. Paul was like. As far like as far as like what he mentally thought he could do, it was anything. Mm. And I suffered from almost being like too much of a realist almost. Right. Where I would go, you can't do that. Right. You know, so I'm gonna write for Nike, I'm gonna get a three million dollar deal. No, you can't. Right. The the best skateboard in the world yeah. doesn't get a million bucks. How are you gonna go with three million bucks? Yeah. Yeah. And I thought I was so logical. Right. But what happened is I think like there's a part of being delusional almost, yep. mm -hmm. that gives you the ability to raise the bar to the next level. Yeah. So like, I always got stuck in like trying to be too real yeah. and almost it, it, by a flaw of holding myself back of what I actually could have accomplished. And I still have to tell myself that today. Like, you know, oh, you could go do this. No, I can't quite do that. Like, I just yeah. know myself. I know what I could. No, dude, if you just switched your mind over and went, yeah. I could yeah. do that, you're gonna go do it, right? Yeah. I think on the other hand, kind of what you're talking about really relates, but, uh, yeah, that was like my thing with it. It was yeah. like just self-limiting belief almost. Yeah. And, and me and Mikey tend to come from two different spectrums on that. And, um, it's funny because like, man, we got to take these personality tests because I just took mine, the disc. Uh, no, I took the, uh, D I S. -C no, is what it I took one from, uh, Deerdick enterprises, uh, uh -huh. did a whole personality test on this whole company yeah. and they sent it to me. It was insights insights okay and uh it was interesting dude yeah really interesting i had a two-hour call after okay. i did my test basically wow. going over my results how i work with people mm -hmm. how i basically if i'm working with somebody the things i can say that they're gonna like and vice versa the things that oh. they can say that i'm gonna hear and what That's i'm not cool. gonna hear uh and dude when she was like breaking this thing down with me ryan was with me it was trippy, dude. Really? It was like spot on. Like the girl almost knew more about myself than I did. It was crazy. And then we started talking about Eric and our personality differences and the way we could like, where we're gonna have conflict, where we wouldn't. It's, yeah. it's so fascinating. <laughs> it's so I'm, so I'm ready. True. I took my test. I need you to I take yours. I need to go take mine. Yeah. My challenge is not like, my, my fear is I always like 
thinking big and then going for it. And it's funny because I don't have a problem executing. I have a problem on which thing I'm executing on. And I also the thing I struggle with is like knowing if I'm being like forward thinking or delusional because my biggest fear is being delusional. I don't want to be delusional, but I like thinking big and like going for big things. So I heard Charlie say something. Fear's the block then. Yeah, well, fear, fear is, yeah, it is, right? but it's like I if I don't have fear, <laughs> That's then a I go theme like in that you're 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 scared on either side. <laughs> well, no, here's the, it well, if I don't have fear, I'll go chase some like dream and Mike he's like, "What are you doing?" And I'm like, "I'm going after this." He's like, "No, not that." And then I'll <laughs> We're doing this. So I have to like check myself. Charlie, and then- Charlie Rock, Rocket uh, had a post today talking about how he's delusionally optimistic. Great. Which I really like that he yeah. said. I thought that yeah. was a really good thing. I get what you're saying on knowing you. <laughs> you've got, you've because, got to work at that though. Yeah. I don't know. Maybe it does come to some people naturally, but that's... Yeah, uh, I agree. I totally not agree. Easy. Mikey's heard a few crazy ideas in his days for me. Eric's a dreamer. As long as uh-huh. I know him, he's a dreamer, which is amazing. Yeah. Um, he's definitely more of a dreamer than I am. Uh, but, dude, it, it's funny, man. Like, a genius mm-hmm. is hard, like in the beginning especially, it's hard to tell if they're a genius or if they're delusional, right? right. They're almost writing right on the line. Mm-hmm. Where you're going, even with the whole thing with the fire Festival, people are like, look at this dude, like, is he a genius or is he a scammer? <laughs> yeah. Right? No, you I, could see I, how it could happen. The so first like 20 minutes, I didn't. I, you I thought tell. he might have been the smartest guy in the room. But I know. So you don't want to tell crazy. somebody like, hey, dude, you're delusional. Right. We're like, shit, you could be a genius, dog. Like, yeah, I, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. You know? You know what, though? I feel like there are certain things with those people that you, there are certain characteristics where they self-sabotage. Oh, yeah. And and that's where like because I I th- these this trips me out, um, and this is an interesting conversation we got into. I, I know because this is really on a tangent, but I kind of love yeah, it. Yeah, it's, it's kind of a it fun. A good so let's go for a couple more. <laughs> so so like, good. think about this though. Like the the delusional people th- that pull it. Yeah, it's like they stuck with this vision and they stuck with it over a long period of time. Most of them. Some of them did it quick. Um, like I used to work for a backpack company, Ogio, and the way he did it is he had this vision of this gym bag and he literally flew, flew to Asia with a cardboard box. I'm going to go get someone to make it. And then he flew over there and he came back and he did it and he made a million bucks when he was like 19 or something. Um, sorry for misquoting that story, but he was delusional away where he pulled it, right? The people that scare me are the ones and that I never want to be are the ones that are like, I'm going to do this. I'm, and then they, they go and self-sabotage and never do anything and they're just delusional. Right. That's kind of my biggest fear. So to check yourself on that, Mikey's going to say something. I could tell. No, just like this little <laughs> to, to check myself on that, like I always think like this is what I want to do and I just have to stick with it over time and make sure that it's 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 a big thing and it's a great thing and I'm willing to stick it out because anything that I didn't do is usually because I stopped doing it. Right. You're both right. It just depends on who's going to execute, you know, who's going right to execute. That it won't work out and you're right that it will, but somebody still has to do it and all the, the way peop- through, you know, and the people who don't are you, they, there's usually some very clear, and I don't want to say names because I'm thinking of a few very specific people, um, but it's because they self-sabotage or they have a cycle mm. that they're, they're defeating themselves and they won't break that cycle. So I think looking inside, maybe this is back to the self-education, yeah. maybe looking back inside and just saying, what am I doing like, to make this not happen every time? Or, right. Um, there's, but in my experience, when people are delusional and don't pull it, there's usually a, a self-sabotaging activity. Yep, I would, I would say. agree. All right, back to Greg. All right, back to Greg. <laughs> that, that was a fun one, man. Yeah. Yeah. I like those ones. All right, cool. So uh, I think we're over time. So let's go ahead and plug what you're doing. Where, where can people find you? Um, yeah. So Greg at Greg Harris, sorry, it's uh, at Greg Harris Group. Two R's, um, one S. Two R's, one S. Yeah. Um, or at Greg M. Harris, either way. But um, Greg Harris Estates is the website. Um, you can contact me through that. Uh, but I'm happy to talk to or meet with anybody considering getting into the business, asking strategy, how I did it, understand their story, what I can do to help maybe direct them in the right way. Um, I wish I would have had somebody do that for me when I started. I didn't have a yeah. lot of guidance in the beginning. And I think, uh, 
you know, certainly have some perspective. So happy to help anybody. Yeah. So uh, anyone listening to this in the LA, greater LA area, take him up on this offer. This is massive. <laughs> yeah. And let's, let's really quickly recap. Like if anybody's looking to, uh, get, get started, uh, you mentioned joining a team. I think so. Yeah. I think joining a team, you just get so much experience, get close to the deals, learn so much more, so much quicker. Um, and you never know where you might fit into that team, whether it's administrative, yep. social media, sales. I mean, there's all different capacities, uh, you know, that you could get involved in. So, yeah. And then if it's on a bigger, if it's on like a $5,000, invest in yourself. If it's that type of level, invest in yourself. I think so. And then if it's, if you're in the 20,000 plus, uh, obviously we have like the, or you have the form on communecapital.com where people can fill out, um, people can DM and uh, figure out kind of what to do, where to invest, and uh, where it fits. We've, t we've been talking about so many different scenarios. So <laughs> we had one called money and skateboarding, one called best ways to make money, and then yeah. today, this topic again. So definitely look for the opportunities. That's kind of the, the moral of the story. And Greg, thank you for being with us. Thank you very much for having me. And we'll wrap it there. <laughs>